Remember, man, that thou art dust, and at dust thou shalt return. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a quick liturgical note. Uh, during Lent, on the ferial days, not on the Sundays, but on the, the days of Lent, there's a, there's a prayer right at the end, after the post-communion, where the priest says, Humiata Capra Vestra Deo, which is a bow down your head to the Lord. And then the prayer is prayed over the people. And so at that point, you, you, you just literally bend over at that point. I'll read you what, what it is for Ash Wednesday. So this will be what the, the last prayer that I'll pray over. Look down, O Lord, in thy mercy upon those who bow before thy majesty, that they who are refreshed by thy divine gift may ever be sustained by heavenly aid. So it's a beautiful prayer. It changes every day, but they're really beautiful. So for your daily Mass uh, during this season, you'll, you'll hear those prayers every day. Okay. Today we're briefly going to consider Lent from the perspective of a practice that God commanded in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy when he commanded the men of Israel to appear before his holy altar to go up to the tabernacle and of course later on to the temple and bring up their tithes and offerings for they were not, quote, to appear before the Lord empty-handed, close quote. And that's Deuteronomy 16, 16. And this is not a sermon about getting your money. It's about tithing. It's interesting to see what it is. What does this have to do with Lent? In order to understand that, we have to take a moment to make sure we understand the spiritual meaning of a tithe in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the tithe, the offering, for example, of the first fruits, was a tithe. A tithe meant one-tenth of all the crops, one-tenth of all the fruit of the trees, and also the firstborn of the cow and the sheep. And they were all offered to the Lord. These offerings were used to maintain the temple, to support the priests, and to care for the poor. But the tithe had a deeper spiritual meaning. It's rooted in the recognition of a basic reality. The reality is that it isn't just our crops, but it's everything that mankind has. All our possessions, even our life itself, comes to us from the hands of a loving God. And so when the people of Israel offered up 10% of the fruits of their labors, which is a real sacrifice, by dedicating that sacrificial tithe to the Lord, they were recognizing that all good things come from His hands. And by offering up to Him the first 10%, they were symbolically offering up to Him all their crops. They were dedicating and sanctifying at the same time the other 90% of their produce. And they gave their first fruits. They gave their very best to the Lord. Not a bunch of leftover, half-rotten fruit or moldy grain or crippled calves or lambs. Not just a little bit of their best, not just a pinch. They gave their best. They gave 10% of their best. So what does this have to do with Lent? Well, there's one thing that we, each one of us, and accepting, of course, we don't speak of Our Lady at this moment, but there's one thing that each one of us can claim as our own. In fact, it's the only thing that we can truly claim as completely our own. This is the only thing we can completely claim credit for. The only thing. And that's our sins. And the reality is that we've shown Him, the Lord our God, our undying gratitude by sinning. And that reality, if we meditate on it enough, should fill each one of us with a profound sense of sorrow and profound desire to make amends by doing penance. So what does this have to do with Lent? Well, the great father and doctor of the Church, Pope St. Gregory the Great, gives us the answer when he points out that Lent is our tithe for the year. That it's approximately 10% of the year, and thus it's our tithe in regards to time. So Lent is rooted in the recognition of a basic reality. The reality that in spite of the fact that we fully recognize that everything that we have, all our possessions, every minute of every day, and even our life itself, all that's coming from the loving hands of God that we've responded to by sinning. And so when Catholics, the people of God in the New Testament, offer our Lent 
in acts of prayer and fasting and penance and spiritual exercises, and offering what should be a real sacrifice, not just something trivial, by dedicating that sacrificial tithe of time to our Lord, we're also symbolically recognizing that all good things come from His hands, and in the process, dedicating and sanctifying the other 90% of the year at the same time. And if the people of Israel gave their first fruits, and again, it wasn't a bunch of half moldy uh, uh, grain, rotten fruit, or crippled calves and lambs, they didn't give just a little bit of their best. They gave their best, and they gave 10% of their very best. Now, if they did that, can we, who have been cleansed not by the blood of goats and calves like them, but by the precious blood of our Lord Himself, can we do any less than to offer up a pleasing tithe, a Lent that's filled up with our very best efforts to pray and fast and do penance and do spiritual good works? So yes, according to the current regulations of the Church, under the pain of mortal sin, all the Latin Catholics are 14 on up have to abstain from meat and super gravy made from meat on Ash Wednesday, today, Good Friday, and all the Fridays of Lent, and all those from 18 to 16 have to fast on Ash Wednesday, today, and Good Friday. On days of fast, only one full meal is allowed. Two other meatless collations may be taken, but together they should not equal a full meal. Eating between meals is not allowed, but liquids are allowed. When health or ability to work would be seriously affected, the fast is not obliged. So those are the current regulations. Under the pain of mortal sin, all those who are 14 on up have to abstain from meat or super grain made from meat on Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, and all the Fridays of Lent. And all those from 18 to 60 have to fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Obviously, all that's required. But is that the best we can do? Let's remember that our spiritual ancestors of faith offered up their very best produce before the Lord. Heaven forbid that on the judgment day we have been given so much would be accused by them of spiritual stinginess. We'll read a few beautiful suggestions from the work of Father Faber to give some ideas, other ideas. Abstain with more than common care from some particular fault which ordinarily besets us. Increase our time of prayer by adding at least half an hour to it. Read longer than usual some spiritual book, not one which will feed curiosity, but one which will excite pious affections towards God, such as the Confessions of St. Augustine, the Imitation of Christ, and the Lives of the Saints. Afflict our bodies with some new penance and prolong some customary penance beyond its usual time. Every time the clock strikes, make a brief but affectionate act of sorrow for the sins of the season. At least three times during the day, with the most profound genuflection, with great feeling, to adore the divine majesty towards the four quarters of the world, in which God is at this time being so grievously offended, desiring in some sort of way to compensate by this loving adoration for the sins which are then being committed in those regions, grieving for them and asking for their remission and for the conversion of sinners, and for that end offering up the precious blood and merits of Jesus Christ, which are most dear to God and most profitable to sinners. It was thus St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi that obtained the conversion of many sinners. To meet with some pious friend and spend a short time daily in spiritual conference, Take more than common care about the spending of our time, so that apart from innocent proper recreation, no part of it should pass in idleness and uselessness, but rather to be more industrious than usual. So those are a few more ideas that might strike somebody as helpful. If when the people of Israel gave 10% of their very best to the Lord, do we, who have been redeemed by the precious blood, do we dare then to give any less than our very best to offer up a pleasing Latin tithe filled with our very best efforts to pray, fast, do spiritual good works and penance and reparation for our sins and the conversion of sinners. So the 40 days of Lent are a tithe in the year which shows our willingness to make reparation to God for sins, 
to express our sorrow for having offended our Lord, who has loved us so much and whom we have offended so deeply, and hold back his just judgments. Let's also remember that it's also traditional to clear any sort of special penances or spiritual practices, whether the confessor or director. But each one of us can do some sort of physical or external fasting, and each one of us can do some sort of spiritual or internal fasting, and each one of us can do some sort of good works, and each one of us can resolve to have the holiest land we've ever had. This year, resolve to have the holiest land you've ever had. After all, Lenten sacrifices aren't only meant to make reparation for our own sins. That's not the only purpose for them. And on that note, one last thought to ponder. In Fatima, in August of 1917, Our Lady said, quote, Pray, pray very much and make sacrifice for sinners. For many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves and pray for them. Close quote. Our Lady of Fatima. Let that not be said of any of us. This Lent, let us not appear before the altar of the Lord with empty hands. Let us each pray, pray very much, make sacrifice for sinners. For many souls go to hell because they are none to sacrifice and pray for them.